When it comes to a good amount of video games, it's usually fairly easy to explain why they exist. You want to destroy a goddess of rot with a giant sword? Swing that b****. You want to roleplay as a trucker experiencing the freedom of the open road? Shift that gear, Brent. You want to be a squid and paint the map in ink because it's somehow easier than shooting the other players? Go s*** on those 10 year olds, brother. But when it comes to life simulators, the genre can be wildly confusing to most people who don't play games or even average gamers. Typically, the point of playing games is that glorious feeling of escapism. Why would you want to get home from a long day of flipping eggs, cleaning, and paying bills just to flip eggs? eggs, clean, and pay bills in a virtual setting. There's a weird, compelling feeling to playing a game like Stardew Valley or Animal Crossing where they're a bit less grounded in reality. Sure, they are technically life simulators, but you're not gonna talk to a talking cat in real life. Maybe. The Sims fills a weird role in the gaming niche. This game is a pretty realistic life simulator. You gotta buy a house, you gotta get a job, you gotta go do the dishes, you gotta build relationships naturally, and more importantly, you gotta go f pee, dude. You're gonna piss yourself in front of your neighbor. Even with all the mundane tasks that are forced upon you in The Sims, the game is still weirdly enjoyable to play. I've been playing these games since I was a young kid, just because the appeal of being a cool adult was a fun concept that I could realize in a video game. This is a series that I've played since The Sims 2 was released in 2004, but since then it seems as though the series has drastically lost its touch. Not only were critics very hard on The Sims 4, but even hardcore and longtime fans were incredibly disappointed in this entry, but why? All right, let's back it up. Back in the late 80s and early 90s, developer Maxis was already on a hot streak releasing two titles, SimCity and Sim Earth, back to back. Each game received very positive praise from critics and fans and helped establish and popularize the city simulation genre, where you grow and develop cities. Think of city skylines, but way older. Co-founder of Maxis, Will Wright, was obsessed with the simulation genre, even going as far as to make a game called Sim Ant in 1991. A game where you simulate uh, ants. A ants. No, I'm serious. You simulate f***ing ants. Look this up. I am so serious. During his time developing SimCity, Will Wright began working on a secret project called Project X, which he initially had trouble getting off the ground. People inside Maxis referred to Project X as the toilet game, where you clean toilets. It also didn't help that during development, they had a focus group to test a few Maxis games where Project X tested incredibly badly. So badly that it performed worse than the three other games testing in that focus group. Will Wright eventually put Project X on hold while he developed SimCity. After a while, he secured a small team to work on the game, focusing specifically on behavior and AI. The same year Sim Ant was released, Will Wright lost his house in a fire, and while rebuilding his life from scratch, implemented these ideals into Project X, a game that we would come to know as The Sims. In 2000, The Sims, or The Sims 1, was released to almost instant critical and commercial success. Around this time, games were mostly marketed to teenage boys, but this game bridged the gap between male and female gamers, allowing it to catch a huge audience that had yet to be tapped into. This game won award after award, and sold 1.77 million copies just in its first year, making it the best-selling PC game that year. Down the road, the developers added seven expansion packs, just furthering the sales. But why was this game so popular? For its time, this game was a technical achievement. The graphics were sharp, the sound design was fantastic, and the AI was surprisingly advanced. The gameplay loop had nearly unlimited replay potential, allowing the game to feel more like a dollhouse rather than a video game, which is actually how the creator of the game initially described it. So to give a rundown of the gameplay if you're not familiar with it, you start the game with a character creator where you create your sim. This is where you customize their look, dress them, and mold their personality based on your astrological sign. Afterwards, you're given a few options in terms of housing, and then you're off. It's time to be an adult, doing a multitude of tasks like getting a job, furnishing your home, cleaning, eating, showering, and building relationships by speaking complete gibberish, or simlish. Yup, this game is pretty much as life simulator as it gets. The game could potentially last forever. A game over isn't really a thing unless you let your sim die. On the subject of death, your sims are mostly fully autonomous and will exist and make decisions on their own, but typically do require a bit of intervention. Your sim won't get a job, pay bills, or exercise unless you intervene as the player. You gotta take care of your sim like it's a little baby. Make sure 
sure they eat, make sure they sleep, make sure they piss. Think of your sim less like an extension of yourself, but rather think of yourself as some sort of all-knowing omniscient god that has full control over this virtual human. Doing these activities isn't all for nothing though. Doing them increases your skill which you can use to further the development of your sim. These skills can advance your career or help develop relationships. On top of the social simulation, you have really interesting tools that allow you to build cool houses. I'm really bad at this in literally every video game that allows you to build houses. Like I genuinely be green topping in every f***ing Minecraft playthrough I do, but the tools here are pretty intuitive for the time and give you a large amount of freedom to be creative. It's f***ing crazy to think that this was a game that almost wasn't made because of its mechanics and then became incredibly innovative and influential in the simulation genre and video games in general. This spawned one of the most popular series in video games ever created. After the total industry dominance of The Sims 1, it would be silly to assume that they let that be a Sims 1 and done because you cannot deny those sales. In late 2000, Maxis returned to the lab, ready to concoct their next life simulator. They spent their development time trying to improve on a few certain aspects that fans love, like the game's irreverence, its open-endedness, and its nestness. <laughs> they did consider doubling down on the realistic simulator aspects with a thirst meter and stress needs, but quickly scrapped these due to fan feedback about maintaining your sim babies. Rather than adding more realistic features, they fleshed out the current ones by making needs differ between different stages in life, like requiring more social activity for teens. It is so f***ing wild seeing a major game developer directly listening to fan feedback and adjusting development time to fit their needs. Values that have seemingly been lost in current times, but we will get to that later. In 2003, they released a trailer for this entry and then fully released the game in 2004. While the premise for the game hadn't changed much, they added so many features that made The Sims 1 look like a McDouble compared to The Sims 2 Big Mac. The gameplay loop is still pretty much identical. Make your sim get a job, build a generational empire, and make sure you pee so very often. This game did feel a bit more immersive than the first, switching from an isometric view to a fully realized 3D environment. They also allowed for a full life cycle from baby to elder, which was only available in the previous game via expansion packs. This allowed for full family trees with genetics passed from generation to generation. This kind of added an almost in-game timer that made it so you had to get all your ducks in a row before your sim croaks. Because of this change, they overhauled sims personalities so that your sim would have aspirations, wants, and fears. Now instead of your personality being fully tied to your astrological sign, it's also influenced by your sims aspirations. Along with the personality changes, the customization of your sims appearance had been fully revamped as well. For 2004, you could get pretty meticulous about your sims design. Being able to customize facial features was pretty huge considering you had a handful of presets for the sims 1. Along with your sims customization, the house construction got a much needed face lift as well, giving you way more power to build your house as you see fit. Oh, and quick note here, the soundtrack f***ing bangs. Every song is so good that I bet Melon would have given it a higher score than My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy. The game is essentially a beefier version of The Sims 1, which turns out is pretty f***ing amazing. This game is widely beloved and was an instant hit as soon as it was released, selling over 6 million copies to date, making it one of the highest selling PC games of all time. Lots of fans consider this entry to be the peak of the series. This, for many, is the best Sims game to date. But honestly, I disagree. Honestly, I could be a fish falling for the most nostalgia bait shit that's ever been cast for me, but man. This, for me, is easily the peak of the entire series. I spent a good amount of my childhood playing this goddamn game because it was released in 2009 when I was only 9 years old. Where The Sims 2 was a more refined Sims 1, The Sims 3 felt like a huge step forward for the series. The Sims 3 Create a Sim was obviously revamped, allowing for more customization than before. A notable change here was the removal of personality points being allocated. In this entry, you have a handful of traits available to choose from, such as being evil, a perfectionist, or being lazy. These let you craft your sim to be more like yourself rather than allocating the stat points to a select few aspects. One of the biggest changes to The Sims 3 was the introduction of an open world map. This was huge. This meant that you had one loading screen, and then the rest of the map was yours to explore. This meant that even if you weren't participating in town life, it was still happening without you. It may feel like it doesn't make a difference, but it really does. It's almost like a life game that's happening every minute of every day, whether you're playing or not.
wait. Anywho, with this new open world, you're offered seamless exploration of an interconnected neighborhood. This truly allowed for more dynamic gameplay. Additionally, to give you an incentive to explore, they added a collection journal that you could use to fill out, similar to a badge-style system in Animal Crossing New Leaf. A lot of The Sims' interaction in this game felt a lot more animated. A lot of the time, it kind of feels like the special moments are happening to you, rather than the special moments happening because you made them happen. NPC Sims will have some wild f***ing interactions that are just so f***ing funny. My Sim went to go get a job in the culinary track, and then on his way out got in a slap fight with some random lady, and then just started talking to them like nothing ever happened. I loved the career rabbit hole options that actually impact your career, like working harder, slacking off, improving your skills, or meeting your coworkers. This made careers feel more in-depth, even if it's just the equivalent of an unskippable cutscene. But the crown jewel of this game is the feature known as create a style. Holy f***. Shit. The amount of in-depth customization you can do in this game is absolutely absurd. Like, I don't even know if I need to get this deep, but you can. You can customize just about anything and everything in this game, giving you full control of how your house and your sims look. I loved the shit out of this game. It is easily the peak of the series for me, and honestly, I don't even see how they could fail at this point. What the f*** is this dude? What the hell happened? After the release of The Sims 3, Maxis was on the hot seat. Sim City, released in 2013, was received quite negatively. This scared the absolute piss out of them, and because of this, they then had to scramble to fix the game that they were currently developing, the Sims 4. They originally tried to make this a multiplayer game, which was something that fans had been asking for for years. After the Sim City disaster, they shifted the game back to single player. But in this scramble, they omitted so many features that this game nearly felt like a demo. Reports internally showed that they were working on short development time and what was essentially a skeleton crew, and it definitely shows with all the features that are missing. I will give credit where credit is due here. The Create a Sim is very in depth and well done, and while I'm not in love with the the art style here, you can make some pretty convincing sims. Plus, the build mode is also pretty deep, but... Where the fuck is creative style? Of all the missed opportunities in The Sims 4, this is one of the most egregious. I find it very hard to believe that this was impossible to do when it was done years prior and on older hardware. Not only are we missing creative style, but yeah, that open world that everyone loved, uh, fucking gone. Yep, you heard me right. No open world. Hope y'all like fucking loading screens because that's all this game is. This heavily discourages going anywhere outside of your house. At this point, I'm just putting multiple multiple sims in one household because filling social this way is so tedious and so annoying. Like going to the bar in Sims 3 was an experience. Going to a bar in The Sims 4 just feels so sterile. Instead of The Sims being at a bar because it's a Saturday and the night is popping, it feels like it doesn't matter what time you go because, well, you're at the bar. Time to populate the area with these meaningless ass sims that are so bland it looks like they were seasoned by a wife feeding their blue collar husband. Coupling this with the really shallow and underdeveloped moodlet system made this game too easy. In the older games, you spend the first several hours kinda slumming it. This made what progress you had a lot more meaningful. In The Sims 4, it's incredibly easy to just game the inspired moodlet and sweep your careers. Like, is it fun to simulate having tons of cash and a cool job? Absolutely. But progression just doesn't feel earned. So many annoying, nagging issues like no swimming pools on release, no toddlers, no basements. Like, all things that are available in The Sims 3. Oh, but don't fret, my friends. You can get these things with their paid f***ing DLC. Go f*** yourself. Look, I know DLC is in The Sims DNA, so much so to the point where it's not even a question of if they're gonna release DLC, but when. The problem is, back in the older games, the DLC were new additions to an already completed game. They added new features and ideas without making the base game completely obsolete. In The Sims 4, you had no choice. You had to buy the multiple DLCs just to catch this up to the game that came out five years earlier. This is honestly the Animal Crossing paradox. If you guys are unfamiliar let me clue you in. Essentially, New Leaf was a huge success and set the following game up New Horizons for big time failure. If you want a more in-depth look at this, go to Voyan's channel, he has like a billion videos on this. But essentially, when New Horizons was released, they tried their best to appeal to the widest audience possible, and in the process, kind of shot themselves in the foot by removing features that needed to be added back in via free updates. This is almost word for word, bar for bar, what happened with The Sims 4. They doubled way down 
down on customization to appeal to the widest audience possible, and in the process cut out way too many features to justify any amount of money being spent on this game. And I'm not saying accessibility is a bad thing. The more people that get to play a game, the better. But it does raise some concerns when the game sold this f***ing well but has reviews like this. Normally, developers would see reviews like this and think, damn. Maybe on the next one we should just try a little harder. But you and I both know a company as shitty as EA putting games out like this will not listen to a f***ing word any of their fans say. And instead see the sales and think, you know, maybe we can keep cutting corners and features and walk away looking like Scrooge McDuck. Wait, old games people appreciate? Newer entries that remove features? Buggy and laggy experiences? Greedy developer? Is this series a- uh, No, no, no. I'm not doing that sh again. This game just sucks, I'm sorry.